Okay. Uh, good morning and welcome to the 29th meeting of the committee in 2014. Everyone present is asked to switch off mobile phones and other electronic equipment as they affect the broadcast system. Uh, some committee members will use tablets uh, during the course of this meeting. Uh, that's because we provide uh, the meeting papers in digital format. Uh, our first item of business is our first oral evidence as part of our Stage 1 scrutiny on the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill. We are starting this process by holding a round table session with key stakeholders to set the scene for this work. We appreciate that some of the groups here today may only have an interest in certain aspects of the Bill, but please feel free to talk about the other parts of the Bill as they come up during this morning's discussion, as this is intended to look at the way licensing impacts on communities in general. Um, I'd like to start by inviting uh, those uh, witnesses and members that we have around the table today to introduce themselves uh, and we will then move on to discussion of the bill. I'm Kevin Stewart, convener of the committee. John? John Wilson, deputy convener of the committee. Cameron Buchanan, member for Lothian. Graham Whiteman, University of Abertay, uh, here as a witness. Alec Rowley, MSP for the Cowden Beath constituency. Uh, Jack Cummins representing the Law Society of Scotland's Licensing Law Committee. Anne McTaggart, MSP for Glasgow. Fiona Stewart representing the Solar Licensing Working Group. Uh, Stuart McMillan, MSP, SNP MSP for the West of Scotland. I'm Callum Steele, I'm the General Secretary of the Scottish Police Federation. Uh, Mark MacDonald, MSP for Aberdeen Donside Constituency. It's Sandra White, MSP for Glasgow Kelvin. Uh, Dr Neve Short, Senior Lecturer in Human Geography at the University of Edinburgh. Thank you all very much. If I could maybe um, start with uh, Dr. Whiteman, I understand that um, your main interest is in air weapons. Um, I wonder if you could give us an overview of how you think uh, the, the bill is, as is. Right. Uh, as to the actual legal aspects of the bill, uh, probably I can't make much of a contribution. Um, although I did make a, a comment about uh, whether the bill ought to actually uh, state the uh, current limits for uh, air weapons because um, uh, the uh, 12 foot pounds, 6 foot pounds uh, in, in the bill to make it clear um, which would be covered by the certificate and which would still need um, licensing. Um, my interest comes from uh, some work we've done with uh, honour students uh, looking at the damage that can be caused by air weapons uh, with uh, looked at firing air weapon pellets into ballistic gel, which is used as a um, simulant uh, for uh, uh, flesh, and uh, seeing how far the pellets penetrate. We've also looked at um, embedding um, uh, organs from uh, animals from an abattoir into uh, ballistic gel and seeing that uh, uh, the pellets would actually uh, penetrate into them. Obviously, it's much more complicated in real life, uh, there's clothing, skin and bone. We've uh, had a look at the effect of clothing on the impact of pellets into ballistic gel. We've had a look at the impact uh, of um, air rifle pellets onto um, bone as well and how the, the pellets can fragment. Uh, so my interest is, is from uh, that aspect of the uh, damage that can actually be caused. As a consequence, taking an interest in the um, statistics of uh, injuries from uh, air weapons in um, the UK and other countries um, and uh, although the numbers are falling there is still a significant number of uh, injuries there was one reported uh, uh, in the news yesterday um, of uh, an 11 year old in um, uh, uh, County Durham um, where he'd been at a football match and uh, an air rifle pellet was actually embedded in his, in his temple uh, so I'd say quite an, uh, interested in the consequence of, um, uh, that air weapons can have. OK, thank you. Cameron, yes, of course. Sorry, what is this joules? I didn't quite understand. What is that? Could you explain that to me, please? Yeah. Joules is the metric equivalent of um, foot-pounds, right. uh, like metres are uh, for yeah. feet and inches. Thank you. Yeah. Anne? Yeah, thanks, convener, and good morning, panel. Um, Although it's no panel, it's a round table, sorry. <laughs> uh, could I start off by asking um, the people around the table their expertise and what's missing from the bill itself, the proposed bill? Could okay. I probably ask Jack first? Uh, OK, Mr Cummins. Yes, um, th thank you very much for that opportunity and for uh, the ability to be here today and to discuss with you the, 
uh, this important bill. Um, I, I think the, the Lost Society's concern is that there are a number of non-policy related matters which are ripe for change uh, in licensing law that have, been, um, that have not been addressed by the bill. Um, matters that affect the workability of the Act that allow businesses to operate efficiently. Um, the key areas are transfers, transfers of licences. Uh, ever since the 2005 Act came into force, the Licensing of Scotland Act, obviously, there have been lots of practical problems with the transfer of licences, which needn't be the case. It was a much simpler system under the previous legislation. Now, the, the raw detail was set out in the Society's full written submission, and I won't trouble you with that at the moment, but suffice it to say, it does make the transfer of licensed businesses much more complicated than it need be, and it is purely a technical matter, which, in the Society's opinion, could be addressed, as I say, without any uh, policy implications. Um, there is also a problem Again, it sounds like a very dry and dusty technical problem, but it is a serious problem with a lack of clarity in the Act about licences ceasing to have effect in certain circumstances. Uh, neither private practitioners nor clerks know exactly what the Act means in that situation. Um, there are problems with um, the surrender of licences by spiteful tenants who hold licences. And there is an ongoing problem with an inability to make a what we would call a site-only application for a licence, as was possible uh, under the, uh, the 1976 Act. So all of that is in the Society's um, written submission. It does sound very arid and not terribly interesting, but uh, nevertheless, these are matters which the Scottish Government has long been aware of, uh, knows that the fix is pretty simple, and it would certainly help uh, lawyers, those whom they advise, and, dare I say, uh, those who advise licensing boards if these matters could be addressed. Um, the uh, committee will have noted that the, uh, the Angostura bitters are no longer going to be uh, treated as alcohol uh, and the Scottish Government has taken the trouble to, to make us uh, sleep safer at night knowing that Angostura bitters will now be alcohol. It strikes me if we can get down to that kind of technical level, we can get down to the technical level that the Law Society would like to, would like to see. Pink gins and long vodkas, eh? <laughs> Dr Short, your expertise is in uh, alcohol licensing as well, I, I yeah. believe. Um, do you have any comments about the bill? Um, I do. My interest in the bill is in the area of over-provision. Um, and in particular, my interest is in Objective 4 of the licensing objectives of the 2005 Act, um, which states the protection and improvement of public health as a licensing objective. Um, and within the um, documentation that was sent through, one of the things that was stated is the concept of over-provision and how it's difficult for licensing boards to use their powers in any meaningful way. And I'm not sure that, um, that the bill um, helps that in, in going forward. And just to put this into perspective, um, I'm interested in over-provision because Scotland has one of the highest alcohol-rated um, harm rates in Western Europe. Um, it has the highest alcohol-rated death rates in the UK. And recent research that we have carried out has shown that alcohol-related death rates are more than double those in areas that have the most outlets compared to areas that have the, the fewest outlets. And um, I mean, so I want more um, in, on over-provision and, and also on the, the types of premises and the capacity um, within the premises as well. Can I ask, have you done any research in looking at if um, provision is greater in areas of deprivation than, than, than in other yeah, areas? Yeah, I have. Um, I have a paper currently um, on review that is looking at um, density in, by deprivation. But the study that we did, um, Kai, had controlled for deprivation. So um, for those of you um, that are aware of kind of statistical models, we hold deprivation constant. So the research that we have done has found this result in all areas, not just in the most deprived areas. We find that death rates are higher in areas with the highest number of outlets, regardless of the level of poverty um, within the area. Ms Stewart, from the solar perspective. We would share a lot of the Law Society's concerns in, in respect of transfers, variations, the lack of clarity in the Act, um, the fact that this, the government guidance that goes alongside with the Act is well out of date. We've had two further Acts since that guidance was actually written. We've had the Alcohol Act and the Criminal Justice Scotland Act, um, so the guidance does need to be brought up to date with the Act, but we would definitely share the Law Society's concerns about transfers, although we may differ slightly in, in some of our views on the solutions. Um, we also welcome the, the, the bringing up to date electronic 
quickly of the Civic Government Scotland Act, but we would perhaps suggest that it's time to overhaul that Act completely as well. Um, it consolidated several <laughs> codexes, but it was written in 1982, and life has moved on considerably since then, and the provisions of the Act may no, no longer meet the requirement of today's society. Thank you. Can I turn to Sandra White? Sandra, you're... A uh, real interest here is in sexual entertainment licences. Uh. It, it is convenient, and uh, before I put my submission or, or perhaps touch on some of the questions that's been raised, I just want to thank the committee for allowing me to be here today. Uh, I must admit, it's much more daunting, I think, being on this side of the table, being a witness than it is uh, asking witnesses. So, greatest respect for all the witnesses that turn up at uh, committee. Yeah, I mean, I do agree about the Civic Government Scotland Act. I think it's long overdue to be looked at, and uh, that's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, I started on, you know, basically the Sexual Entertainment Act. Uh, councils would refuse an application. Uh, invariably, they would be appealed. They would have to go to the court of session here in Edinburgh, and invariably, it would be lost the appeal, uh, resulting in the councils having to spend a lot of money, and the taxpayers' money is also and then having a, a number of uh, constituents uh, in their area who were very unhappy about not just the sexual entertainment licences, but also over-provision as well. If I could just touch on in one of the areas which I think you probably referred to Mr Cummings and perhaps Mrs Stewart as uh, the grandfather rights in that respect, and I, I would call them grandfather rights transfer of premises if they've already had a premise uh, and basically they refuse the licence. I think in the the bill, uh, page 43 of the bill, and it's uh, section 6A, where it mentions local authority may refuse an application for the grant or renewal of a licence, despite the fact that a premises licence under part 3 of the Licensing Scotland Act 2005 is in effect in relation to the premises vehicle, vessel or stall to which the application relates. I think that covers that particular part of the grandfather rights and the transfer as well. It was also raised not by yourselves but others in regard to EU legislation. I think the EU legislation that's been satisfied also. And another issue is there's a precedent has been set in England and Wales where they have this licence, where it's a licence of choice for local authorities, whether they wish to have a zero tolerance aspect to looking at licensing of sexual entertainment licences. I'm happy to take any questions on that particular subject of the sexual entertainment licences. I'm sure we'll get a number of those. If we can maybe take Mr Steele though, to give us the, the Police Federation's view on the draft bill. The, thank you, Convener. The, the Police Federation has concentrated their comments largely on the, the firearms, sorry, the air weapons licensing element of it. And uh, I think it's uh, only right and proper that I advise the committee that I have been a, um, an active participant in field sports for over 25 years, uh, and I hold uh, shooting insurance with the British Association of Shooting and Conservation. Uh, and our comments uh, on the, the bill are uh, obviously clearly heavily informed by uh, the experience of our members and also uh, from any personal experience uh, any of us may uh, be able to bring to the table also. Where... Where the Scottish Police Federation has uh, some concerns, um, they're not really principally about the, the, the provisions of the bill, but more about the capacity of the service to, uh, to deliver the expectations placed upon us. Uh, that being said, there are some um, apparent inconsistencies between the current licensing regime, particularly for firearms and shotguns, uh, and uh, uh, the conditions that may be applied to uh, particularly firearm certificates, but not shotgun certificates, and the potential for uh, or the question of applying consider, uh, specific conditions to an air weapon certificate. I think it's probably uh, more likely than not that there will be a significant number of licensing offences uh, uh, created as a consequence of this legislation. Uh, and uh, it's unclear uh, whether there is any evidence to support the fact that the legislation in its own right will reduce the criminal use of air weapons, which, of course, everybody recognises as a, uh, as a particular issue. Um, uh, I suppose probably in a nutshell, that's probably the, the middle on both ends of it. Thank you very much. I should probably declare that uh, many moons ago I managed to achieve various marksman's badges in the Air Training Corps, but that was very much in yesteryear. Um, and do you want to come back in? No. 
No, okay. no, I'm okay. Just if anybody wants to come in, just here. indicate at any point, and you know, this is an uh, informal uh, session, so just indicate when you want to come in. Sandra. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I'm glad that you've allowed me to come back in. I have, I have to say that basically when I started looking at the, this uh, sexual entertainment licence, I was really uh, overwhelmed with the uh, contacts from not just organisations but individuals also, not just in Scotland but uh, uh, from London as well and, and other areas of, of Britain. Uh, one of the areas which really concerned me was that uh, women who had been coming home from work were being accosted uh, by men who were frequenting these clubs. Uh, there's proof of that. And also, which I was really surprised about, was a professional body of women who were saying that they were unable to get promotion because part of the, the, their job was to entertain clients and therefore, in that respect, they were take, to be taking them out to certain clubs such as lap dancing clubs, and I won't give the name of the particular one that's in London, I'm sure you can think what it was. They refused to do that, and they felt that was uh, they were, they were uh, not being given promotion in that respect. So it's not just the aspect of women were being accosted, it was also the aspect of uh, promotion was being denied if they didn't follow through in this particular aspect. Thank you. Cameron? Thank you. Sandra, could I just come in and say... What do you think about the, the word appropriate number of sexual entertainment clubs? I mean, they're, they're obviously going to happen, um, but do you think, how do you define appropriate? I mean, in areas or in number? Well, basically, the, the reason we went for a zero tolerance uh, number, none that you could say that we don't want any whatsoever, is the fact that we were given the choice to the local authorities. Uh, the bill doesn't make this uh, legislation mandatory. It's up to each local authority to fit into the legislation. So when it comes to appropriate clubs, if a local authority such as Glasgow, for instance, thinks that no clubs are appropriate, they would be allowed to go forward in this particular uh, piece of legislation. For myself, uh, personally, yeah. I would like to see none of these clubs exist. I think they're demeaning to women. And as I've said before, uh, women have contacted me, have been accosted, coming home from their work, going up the stairs to the, the close, which is next door to these particular clubs. So in my personal opinion, I would see a zero as being appropriate. Uh, I don't disagree with that, but I think it's... Uh, I just think it's unrealistic to say it's going to be zero. Therefore, should, should there not be some sort of... It, it's got to be restricted to local authorities, hasn't it, realistically? Well, they, they, that's what I, that was why I, I decided at the end not to make it mandatory. Yeah. It means that a local authority could say two clubs then, yeah. if they wished, yeah. you know, in the legislation... And it would be up to that local authority to explain to their electorate why, why? Okay. They, they chose okay. this particular Thank number. You. Um, you. you could, of course, uh, play devil's advocate here and say that if there was a complete ban, all of this would be driven underground and un unlicensed. Mm. I wonder if Ms Stewart has a, a view from Solar on this particular point. Um, it's quite difficult for Solar in this regard um, because we are the officers um, in local authorities, so we don't have the political clout. So obviously our councillors would ultimately be deciding. Um, we would regulate as officers any licensing scheme that came to us. The difficulty that we see in regulation is that the provisions that you're proposing for the Civic Government Act uh, have differing definitions to the adult entertainment that's covered under the Licensing Scotland Act. And as officers, we've got to regulate both and administer both systems who's going to be the regulator is it going to be the licensing board is it going to be the local authority um, the differing definition definitions would make it difficult for officers um, it, there of those differing definitions please Ms Stewart I think the, that would be useful. the licensing Scotland Act talks about adult entertainment um, which is defined in the act um, I can't put my finger on the exact section at the moment. But the, the sexual entertainment is much more strictly defined and more widely defined. But there was the recent case of Bright Crew against the City of Glasgow Licensing Board, which basically stipulated if it doesn't relate to the sale of alcohol, a licensing board can't regulate that and enforce that. So perhaps it might be better to remove the adult entertainment from the Liquor Act and leave it with the Civic Government Scotland Act or vice versa. Um, but something would have to be done about the enforcement from an officer's perspective. Thank um, you. John Wilson, please. Well, thank you, Convener. Good morning. Uh, just to ask Ms Stewart and maybe Sandra White would want to comment on this. 
Sandra White's just put forward the proposition that we should ban that type of entertainment altogether in local government, or we should give local authorities the power, local authority by local authority, to take decisions to ban that type of entertainment taking place within the local authority. Would the, or could you perceive there being a problem if, say, in Glasgow took a decision of a blanket ban, Edinburgh and Aberdeen decided to allow these types of clubs to exist, that would it not then lead to legal action being taken against Glasgow for interpreting legislation differently from other authorities in Scotland? I, I'm not sure I know the answer to that question, I'm afraid. Sandra? Thank you, thank you John. You, you raise a very interesting point. And, um, having looked through all of the submissions in regards to this particular uh, part of the legislation, I note that all the local authorities are very keen to have this type of legislation, Edinburgh in particular, as well as, as Glasgow. I don't think there would be anything raised against the law if the legislation is there. But if I could just touch on um, what Ms Stewart said in regard to... You know, Officers have noted of causeless submission, which basically welcomes the creation of a separate licensing regime for sexual entertainment venues. They say that uh, uh, the legislation gives them proper powers. Now, obviously, COSLA being the, the, the umbrella body of all local authorities, they're very welcoming of this particular part of the legislation. They see it as a way forward and something that would make it easier for them uh, for the differentiation of sexual entertainment, adult entertainment and alcohol licensing as well. So I don't think there would be a problem, actually, looking at COSLA submission. But Do obviously, I'm not an officer, sorry. so I would be... <coughs> sorry, sorry. Convener, I was just trying to get to clarification on the situation, whether or not... we. The Scottish Government should be leaving it to local authorities to licence uh, sexual entertainment, or it should be the, no, the local authorities, because my fear would be that you could end up uh, with the same companies operating in Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen, then challenging uh, the local, that local authority, taking them to court and saying, if it's permissible in Aberdeen or Edinburgh, why is it not permissible in Glasgow? Uh, and uh, I just, it's just to try and avoid lengthy legal wrangles taking place in the courts and then the courts deciding what the appropriate use of the legislation would be rather than this parliament. Well, Sandra? The, the, sorry, the legislation that stands at the moment is, is proposed it does go down as far as zero. So I would assume that if you have legislation that is law, then that is the letter of the law. I can't see myself, but this is just submission for me, all of these uh, you know, entertainment venues moving to one particular place. As I've said, I've read the submissions from the local authorities. They want some form of tightening up. And as Cosler has said, they look forward to this you know, legislation. They think it's a way forward. I think if the legislation is there, it goes as far as zero. It is the choice of the local authority. Whether they implement it or not, then I don't think it would be challengeable in court as it is in, you know, it's in the legislation. Cameron? Son, I was just going to ask, what about the underage girls? Is there any way we can legislate for under 18? Uh, over, over 18? Surely that's part of the problem too, isn't it? These underage, or boys, whatever it is. Well, I mean, obviously... And, I don't know if Callum wants to come in this well, particular one, but uh, you know the police do uh, regular visits to these types of clubs. Yeah. Uh, most clubs have the, you know, the, you've got to proof of age, that type of thing, right. uh, basically. So why don't you talk? I'm only talking about this entertainment license. You have the same problems in any pub or club, and they usually have the 25 tolerance age group. Uh, having visited a number of these clubs in, in a purely professional aspect is before I started uh, looking at this bill, to see the concerns that were raised with me if, if that was the case, I certainly didn't see any, I would say, underage uh, girls uh, in there, or, or boys, or either customers mm. or otherwise. Uh, I think the police and the licensing regulations would certainly look at underage and would expect them to check anything in regards to that is against the law to get into licensed premises, consumer drink anyway. So mm. the law already stands in that respect. Could I just, sorry, just raise one other? Quickly. Very point. In Austria, for example, they have certain areas in Austria where it's licensed and other areas not, and people then go to those areas and not. So it could happen in Scotland that if Glasgow didn't want it, but East Rend did or something, people would just go there, I suppose. 
Are you, what do you think on that? I, I, don't, I, I personally don't think that would happen. And, right. and we look at the situation in Amsterdam, the red light district, where people talk about that. But that is closing down now. It's not uh, being part of the economy. It's not looked upon as a good thing for Amsterdam anymore. Uh, so that's falling yep. apart. We don't have the same red light districts there either. Uh, I certainly don't think it would happen. OK, thank you. Callum, um, I wonder if you could give us uh, a perspective from your members on, on this one um, in terms of uh, sexual entertainment licences and the policing of them. Does that cause a huge amount of difficulty? Yes, yeah, thanks, Convener. I'm, uh, I'm glad you uh, phrased the question the way you did, because uh, I, I cannot speak for Police Scotland and wouldn't, uh, wouldn't presume to do so. Uh, but the description that uh, Sandra gave about uh, uh, the activities are certainly the, certainly the age of those that uh, um, frequent uh, these kind of premises is certainly would be in keeping with the experience of, uh, of our members, or certainly those that uh, have raised any comment on it. Uh, it's probably largely significant that this is not something that is uh, uh, regularly featuring in discussions of the Scottish Police Federation, which suggests in its own right uh, that the question of age is not, uh, is not a problem for us. Okay, and in terms of if there was a complete ban, do you think that would cause difficulty for, for your members in terms of uh, trying to deal with an industry that maybe go underground? Well, there are many things that are illegal. Prostitution is illegal. Uh, we deal with it uh, day and daily. Uh, the question is, is whether it's the right thing to do, and ultimately the legislators will, make that, uh, will take that particularly, particular view. Uh, one thing police officers are very adept at is uh, finding out where illegal activity takes place. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that enforcing the law surrounding that is, is, uh, is equally easy. I mean, it's, it's, it, would almost be, um, it would almost be unusual for uh, local police officers not to know where, for example, and I appreciate I'm drifting off into prostitution again, where, for example, uh, prostitution was taking place in domestic dwellings uh, or uh, underground, to, to use the, the, uh, the terminology that would apply. And similarly, I think that the, uh, the same uh, exposure to knowledge to identify premises where illegal uh, adult entertainment will be taking place wouldn't take long to come to our, to, to come to our attention either. Of course, having the knowledge and the intelligence uh, does not necessarily translate into having the, into having, uh, the information to, to bring much before the courts. Uh, but the, the intelligence systems that are available to the police service mean that if it was to prevail in an illegal manner, uh, that we would almost certainly have the <coughs> capability to identify uh, and ultimately work on developing the resource to enforce. Uh, Mr Cummins, you want to come in? Yes, just, just in relation to um, what Ms White was saying in relation to um, sexual entertainment venues, um, and she adverted to grandfather rights. Um, the society notes that there's a paradox here. Um, we will have premises that are licensed to sell alcohol under the Licensing Scotland Act 2005. They will be authorised in terms of their operating plan uh, to provide adult entertainment. And as Ms Stewart mentioned, that's rather different from sexual, inter uh, sexual entertainment. But there will be situations... What, what's the, the difference? What's the definition difference there? Find a de definition in the Act. The, there is no definition of, strangely enough, of adult entertainment in the 2005 Act. There is a definition in the late night regulations. But um, the, dare I say that the definition um, proposed in this bill uh, is uh, very detailed and I don't think there's any room for doubt about what sexual entertainment would be. Uh, I think adult entertainment is at, shall we say, a lesser level, if I can put it just as generally than that, than sexual entertainment. But a situation... I, 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 I'm sorry, but I, 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 maybe I'm being a little naive here because, I, I, I mean, a lesser level, I don't know what that means. Well, um, I, I think if you looked, yeah, I'm sure you have looked at the definition um, of uh, sexual entertainment in this, mm -hmm. and it's just so slightly frustrating that we can't lay our hands on one of the 30 sets of regulations that have been published under the 2005 Act in relation to the definition of adult entertainment, um, th there, is, there is more sexuality, if you like, involved in sexual entertainment than adult entertainment, which might be, I'm just trying to think what adult entertainment might amount to from a licensing board perspective. Ms Stewart? Yeah, could cover things like Anne Summers parties yes. or a stag night or a hen night that perhaps has a stripper invited along, which could take place in any pub or hotel, rather than the types of establishment that you would see in Glasgow, Edinburgh or Aberdeen. Yes. So I, it, would, it would be that sort of level. I think that's right. Maybe a sort of full, full Monty type of a thing. But I, I think the society's um, concern is that you could end up with premises um, having uh, a licence granted by the licensing board to sell alcohol, 
permitted to provide adult entertainment, but refused a license as a sex for a sexual entertainment venue by the licensing authority sitting separately. Um, the licensing board, uh, rather the law society, said in its submission that it thinks it would be better um, if the licensing of sexual entertainment venues uh, was to be placed with the licensing board. So the sale of alcohol and the regulation of sexual entertainment was with the one body. Uh, bearing in mind that the licensing board will have experience of the premises in question, will have a knowledge of their history, will know whether there have been in fact problems with them, whether they have been well conducted. Um, well, you hope the licensing board will have all of these things. Big pardon? You hope that the licensing board will have all of this knowledge. I've always had faith in of course. <laughs> um, I, I, and, of course, um, there is the possibility that premises that have not given any cause for concern to the police or the licensing board uh, will inevitably, uh, in some occasions, find themselves um, out of business or possibly have to reinvent themselves with some other form of entertainment that is not sexual entertainment. Uh, Mark? Yeah, I, I hear what Mr Cummings is saying, and he says that this sets up a potential paradox. I'm not entirely sure I follow why it's a problem if, if we accept that a sexual entertainment licence is at a level beyond that of adult entertainment, then it surely follows that if a, a, a local authority takes a view that it is comfortable with the provision of adult entertainment as defined in the regulations, but less comfortable with sexual entertainment as defined in the regulations, then surely it's perfectly acceptable for that local authority to take the step of refusing that licence, irrespective of whether the venue in question has alcohol licence, has the ability to provide adult entertainment, if that's what the local authority determines. I'm not sure I would accept that that is either a paradox or essentially a bad thing for, for, that could happen. Mr. Cummins? Yeah, perhaps that's this is too simplistic an answer, but of course, at the moment, licensing boards are licensing uh, premises that provide an adult entertainment and uh, sexual entertainment because the greater includes the, the lesser. Uh, and the point I was striving to make earlier is that they know about them, they've experienced, they've come before them, uh, they've been before the licensing board on no doubt various occasions, and they will have a track record that the licensing board will have that the licensing authority will not. So it's, uh, putting it crudely, it's resulting possibly in people who have not been a grief to the authorities going out of business as a result of this. Now, that's a policy matter that's not for the law society, but it's certainly the paradox that I'm referring to. True, true but then by the same token, um, uh, as Sandra White has identified, a number of these venues have es essentially... Um, I would say exploited an unintended loophole within the 2005 Act, whereby um, the, the type of entertainment that is being offered may be the type that the local authority does not wish to see being provided, but because there was not the stipulations that are now being introduced, um, the, essentially through legal challenge they were able to circumvent that. So um, some of these premises may have been operating for some time, um, but they're operating as a consequence of a loophole rather than a consequence of policy intention. Ms Stewart wants to come in, and I'll take you back in, Mr Cummins. Thank Ms you. Stewart. I have been handed a de definition of adult entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, it means any form of entertainment which, A, involves a person performing an act of an erotic or sexually explicit nature, and B, is provided wholly or mainly for the sexual gratification or titillation of the audience. Okay, thank you. Mr Cummins, you want to... Yeah, yeah, yes, um, uh, uh, there is an important point here about a so-called regulatory gap that means that licensing boards don't have or supposedly don't have power to regulate sexual, uh, sexual entertainment. It's a case called Bright Crew. I think that uh, Ms Stewart adverted to that earlier. And on one view, may I say that the Law Society's committee has not got a unanimous view uh, on the, um, the, the uh, import of, of Bright Crew, but on one view, the view that um, Scottish ministers have obviously taken and the Scottish Government is that licensing boards can only regulate the sale of alcohol and that they can't regulate other matters. Now, that, that's one interpretation of Bright Crew. From a personal point of view, I think that's a misreading of, of Bright Crew, but I perfectly understand the point that you're making because that's the point upon which the, the, uh, this part of the bill is proceeding that it is giving. So uh, in some parts of Scotland, then, 
um, where, you know, from my experience, there's been a licensing board dealing with alcohol provision and licensing committees dealing with the aspects of the, of the various civic acts. Um, are you saying basically that the licensing board would deal with alcohol? Would the licensing committee therefore deal with the sexual entertainment aspects of all of this? That is the way in which the uh, matters are, 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 are going to be structured. I, I, I'm watching, uh, but I'm talking about currently as well. I'm oh, yes, watching Miss well. Stewart shake her head there. Um, I, at the moment, um, unless a, a, a licensing authority has resolved that there is a public entertainment licence requirement for such venues, there would be no civic government licensing of sexual entertainment premises. At the moment, they would only have a liquor licence in many parts of the country. OK. Right. That's a bit clearer there. Um, Sandra, did you want to come in there? I, 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 I'm going to try and move on to other things as okay, well, so not just fact, stick to thank this. You, thank you, Kevina, for, 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 for that. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, what Ms Stewart says is right, and I think that's where the problem lies. And Mark McDonald, I think, explained it very well. The complaints I have and the concerns I get from local authorities and the submissions is that they are powerless in regards to sexual, you know, entertainment licences. This uh, part of the bit, this bill, the submission would give them those powers, sexual entertainment. They could look at that, not necessarily in conjunction just with the alcohol licence. And I do, I do take a bit of issue when you mention um, and summer's parties. It's not as if I think people would apply to the local authority for a licence for an Anne summer's party. So I say, I, I take that out of the equation actually, and, and that type of uh, you know so-called, if you want to call it entertainment, but. Uh, <laughs> I thank you all for, 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 you know, for the comments and certainly have a look at them. OK, thank I think, you, you know, again, uh, when we get down to the nitty-gritty of some of these things, while you're having something in your own home, which most of these kind of things take place in, in terms of Anne Summers parties, not that I've ever had one, I have to say, um, there are also these quite big corporate ones, are there not, which would have to be covered, I would imagine. Ms Stewart? I think it depends on what part of the country you come from. Uh, I come from a, a rural authority and quite often the licensed premises are community venues and there are some charity groups that would hold such functions in licensed premises rather than in, a, in their own home. So it was just it was purely an example to highlight the difference between what could be classed as adult entertainment as opposed to sexual entertainment proposed in the new bill. Um, so what we have is a lack of consistency across the country, which hopefully the draft bill will, will deal with that lack of consistency. Would that be right? I would agree, but I, I think that um, the Solar would still have concerns about, yes, regulation is welcome because you, you can regulate these premises, but who's regulating what? Uh, we've got adult entertainment regulated by the licensing boards, sexual entertainment regulated by the local authority, where do you draw the line because we would have enforcement officers under both regimes going into these premises, what are they looking for are they going to be caught out under the liquor legislation or are they going to be caught out under the civic government legislation and I think that's where the different definitions give officers problems mm -hmm. um, so, so Alec I would say that there needs to be further clarity on that. Where does the role of the licensing mm -hmm. board stop and the role of the local authority begin? OK, I think that's very useful. Thank you. Uh, I want to, to move on. Um, and a lot of research has highlighted that boards uh, find the concept of over-provision and capacity difficult to define and measure. Um, and having come from a local authority background myself, like many others round the table, um, there were often cases where licensing boards made decisions uh, not to grant a, a license for reasons of over-provision, which were almost immediately overturned by courts. Um, Dr Short, do you think that the, the draft bill itself and the provisions within the bill will help uh, in that regard and give local authorities uh, a little bit more power in that regard uh, and hopefully not see the courts move in and, and overturn decisions that are made locally. Um, I think that um, in the documentation that you sent out, one of the most striking things was the, the very, very small numbers of applications that were refused. Um, so during 2011-2012, um, 
only, two, only 21 licenses were refused, um, compared to 347 granted, and in 2012-13, 12 refused, compared to 332. Um, granted, so this shows the difficulties um, for local authorities as well in kind of looking at the licensing objectives. The, the idea of overprovision is that nobody has defined what overprovision means, and, um, and that's problematic for, for licensing boards and for um, local people. One of the other problems in assessing overprovision is that local communities don't have the evidence um, available to them. So when I talk about the, the study that we've just completed, it took us nine months to gather the data on the locations of alcohol outlets throughout Scotland. That's not available in a central um, repository. If you look at the tobacco retailers register, we can easily um, get that data and, um, and look at the idea of tobacco. But for alcohol, we don't have such a data set. So we had to contact each of the individual um, licensing boards to gather that data, and it took nine months of data gathering and data cleaning. So it's not made easy for local communities to then go along to licensing boards and put across their, their side in terms of overprovision because they simply don't have the data available. So if anything could be done to make that more readily available, then I think it would also help the licensing boards in answering this objective. What I would welcome within the bill is the idea of um, being able to define an, an entire area as um, an area of over-provision, an entire board area. And, uh, and the reason for that is because the um, health statistics that we work with to look at objective four of protecting and improving public health, the data isn't available at very small local area level. Often we're, we're, we're asked, you know, well, if this pub opens in this area, what will, um, what will happen? That, that data is not released because it's, um, it's confidential data. And, um, and there's also a statistical error if we work with very small numbers. So if we're able to look at it at a, at a whole board level, um, then, yeah, maybe we are able to break it down a little bit. Um, but I would very much... Um, I'm very, very happy to see that um, within the bill, that we can look at whole area levels in terms of provision. So your suggestion previously, local authorities, if there were difficulties in terms of numbers of... Uh, social housing could put in pressured area status and stop sales of social housing in that patch. You're suggesting that within patches or within the entire local authorities, um, there, there could be this blanket um, ban on any new licences or a provision to do that. So I'm bill. not sure what you meant by when you referenced social uh, yeah, housing within uh, that? Yeah, well, I, I, it was just an example of where authorities in another way have managed to to control policy issues by having blanket bans mm -hmm. on something in, in particular places. You think there could be uh, a, an argument for an over-provision blanket ban in communities or in entire local authority areas? Well, yeah, yes, because I think that the, the idea of over-provision um, isn't used at the moment. Um, you know, the licensing boards, have, have, are they refusing licences based on over-provision? And as you, if you have said, if they are, they're being overturned. Um, and also... I, I, I am very um, passionate about the idea that, you know, as, as residents um, in areas, we should be able to easily access data on the numbers of licensed premises uh, within our local areas, and then residents can use that um, to go along to licensing boards. Okay, thank you. Mark? Yeah, a couple of things, Convener. Um, firstly, I'd be very interested to know when this research is likely to become available. But also within the research, obviously, there's, a, there's an aggregation uh, around licensed premises. You've got your off licenses, you've got your pubs, you've got your uh, nightclubs, you've got your hotels. Um, th is that disaggregation uh, covered as well? Because obviously in some, I mean, I can think of a community in my constituency where there are a number of hotels and, and a couple of community pubs. So um, to all intents and purposes, if you were to look, and also obviously some off licenses as well, but if you were to look at that simply on the number of licensed premises, without looking at what those licensed premises are, it might give a misleading impression uh, of, of over-provision necessarily within specific <coughs> communities, although there are undoubtedly areas where, uh, and I'm sure the convener is somebody who represents the, a city centre area, will, will understand there are some communities where there is a significant amount of licensed premises in mm -hmm. concentrated areas. I'm going to try not and start, uh, to start in my own constituency <laughs> in this regard. Uh, Dr Short. Um, the... the 
report is available now. Um, I can send that to you um, after today. And um, we did. We, we were able to disaggregate the data um, by on sales and off sales premises, and we found the greatest effect was off sales premises. And we think that's because of the cheaper products available, that it could be accessible to underage, and that there's no control over who the final recipient of the um, off sales product is. Um, so we did see the strongest effect with off-sales. And this, is, this isn't just unique um, within Scotland. This is the first time that this, has, this has been done in Scotland. But there is evidence elsewhere, particularly from North America and Australia, which has also found this. What we weren't able to do um, was to look at the idea of capacity, so the size, as you kind of allude to, whether it's a, you know, a small village pub or a, a large um, you know, multi-floored premise um, in the grass market, for example. Um, that data is simply not available, which is why I would really like to see um, something um, that will make a, a, a retailer's register much like the tobacco retailer's register. Because if Scotland is to move forward in thinking about overprovision, then we need the data. <laughs> we need the information to be able to assess what overprovision is. And I think that this has been the problem for the licensing boards in that often the information is not available. Mark, do you want to come back? No, I just think I think it would be very useful, convener, to see the the data that's being collected and to have a look at the report. And I think that Dr. Short makes a very interesting point, which I'm sure we can pick up at later stages of the evidence. Thank you, Stuart McMillan, please. Thank you. Just in terms of the, your comments there, Dr. Short, uh, regarding the, the off uh, trade, uh, do, you, do you do you have any further information regarding the, the types of of facility? that actually are uh, selling this uh, alcohol? Is, it, uh, is there a, kind of a higher propensity uh, for alcohol to be sold from supermarkets as compared to traditional off-sales uh, premises? Dr uh, Short? Um, no, this is where the data, again, um, you know, this is where we need, we need this data. Um, so we need to be able to find out whether or not it's large-scale supermarkets, whether it's small um, corner shops. We need to know the capacity of the... Um, the off-sales retail units as well as the capacity for the on-sales retail units, the size of the floor space that is given um, to alcoholic products. Um, so all of this is information that we will be um, building and we will be working on in further work. Um, but for now, we um, looked at on-sales and off-sales. Mr Cummins wants to come in there, Stuart. I'll take you back. Mr Cummins. Yeah, well, yes, I think the research you're referring to is the research that's presented to the Alcohol Focus uh, conference on the 7th of October. Um, that uh, post dates the society's submissions, so I'm sort of, you know, flying by the seat of my pants here, maybe expressing a, 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 a personal view. Um, as I understand it, the study was cross sectional and further analysis required to be further analysis required to be made. And you say in page 10 of the report, now I'm not taking anything away from the report itself, it's very interesting and highlights some statistical anom anomalies, but you do say on uh, page 10 that you kind of positively say that there's a correlation, a yep. causal link if you like, yep. between the density of licensed premises and alcohol harm. Um, you're no doubt aware that the University of Cardiff um, mm -hmm. is involved in research at the moment which is £416,000 worth of funding from the National Institute for Health Research. Mm -hmm to look at, I think, over a three-year period, mm -hmm. the impact of changing alcohol outlet density yeah. and health-related harm. So it's obviously, if I may say so with respect, a very important piece of work, but there, is a lot of thing, there are a lot of things happening in academia mm -hmm. to get the solution, get the answer to the actual link uh, so just... between health harms and outlet density. Yeah. And I think it would be important, convener, if I may say so, that... Um, uh, if this research has been looked at, a broad spectrum of academic research should be examined. Oh, um, we'll be looking at a lot of things, Mr um, Cummins, I can assure you of that. You. Dr Short. Um, thank you. Yes, we do, we do say, like any good academic research, um, we will note our limitations at the end. And we did note that this was correlation, um, not causation, because we need to look at it through time in order to indicate causation. Um, I think that looking at the statistics on the, uh, in the documentation that we were given, we can see that there's very little change um, in some of the um, licences that are granted or not granted um, within Scotland. And we do need to look at this over a long time period. Um, and the data, a register would help us to do that. I will point you to an article published by Campbell in 2009 in the American Journal of Preventative Medicine that looked at a systematic review of studies through time that have looked at alcohol licensing. And um, they um, found nine time series studies, seven of which found that um, increases in alcohol outlet density were linked causally through time 
uh, with increases in alcohol consumption and related harms, um, particularly interpersonal violence. They also noted um, that, yes, like our study was cross-sectional, but of the 47 outcomes that were looked at by cross-sectional studies, 41 found positive associations. And I think that it's important to say that, yes, we may find causation through time, but in order to find causation, we first need to find correlation, and that wherever there will be correlation, um, we may find causation. Sure, you want to come back? Yeah, briefly, thanks, convener. Um, obviously, with, uh, as a consequence of the 2005 Act, um, it's different regulations came in uh, set from 2007 onwards regarding the floor space uh, mm -hmm. available uh, within facilities to sell alcohol. Um, now, in terms of the research that you have undertaken uh, and the information you have up to now, has there been any change uh, in terms of the, the, the number, well, well, the total uh, level of alcohol that's actually been sold um, from pre the 2005 Act to as compared to now? Dr Short. We don't have sales data. Right, okay, thank you. Uh, Mr Steele, um, do your members have a, a view in over-provision of licences? I think your members in uh, my particular patch have a view in over-provision, but is there a general view from the Federation on over-provision of alcohol licences? It's, uh, it's not something we've considered in uh, any great detail, convener. However, uh, the, the issue of, uh, of over-provision is one, which clearly the discussion just now is exposing, is one that's difficult to nail down. Uh, because if you look at the capacity in many of the licensing venues that exist in the uh, times between 10 o'clock at night and 3 o'clock in the morning, they're all full to the, full to the gunnels. Uh, and I dare say many would argue that uh, if there were more, there could be more space contained within them. So it would be difficult to say that in that particular example there, there is over-provision. Uh, yet the self-same venues from uh, probably from 11 o'clock in the morning to 3 o'clock in the afternoon would be uh, largely empty. So m measuring provision and capacity for provision is something that's not easily done. Um, I think it's uh, universally acceptable, accepted, however, that uh, uh, where there are uh, generally lots of uh, uh, particularly licensed premises that have on-sales, uh, uh, on-sale capacity, that that does result in uh, uh, considerable additional uh, demand on police time and resource uh, out with the premises when they eventually spill out. Thank you. Uh, John Wilson, please. Thank you, Convener. Just to ask Dr Short, and I know the study has been limited that you've carried out so far, but one of the big problems that exists in many communities is not, as Mark MacDonald indicated, the hotel trade or the bar trade. It's the off-licence trade, the small corner shop that's selling the well-known tonic wine, uh, in, particularly in the areas that I live in, like Lanarkshire, uh, which are the real problems uh, in terms of communities. How would you propose to measure that type of uh, you know, sale? Because floor space doesn't come into the mm -hmm. equation when I can take you to an off, a small off-licence that will sell anything in, in excess of maybe... 200 bottles of that well-known tonic wine uh, on a Friday night. Mm -hmm. uh, to, so how do we get to the situation where we make a, an assessment based on a supermarket having the off-licence and the proliferation of small corner shops mm -hmm. that insist that they have to have an off-licence to trade? Mm -hmm. But what they're trading in is the... You know, the the type of alcohol uh, beverage, or whatever you want to call it, that is actually causing more problems mm -hmm. and is more problematic in relation to communities uh, throughout Lanarkshire and Central Scotland. Dr Short. Yeah, I think it is important that in research going um, forward that we need to look at types of outlets and products sold um, within different types of outlets as well. And it's important to recognise um, that there are different pathways through which over-provision or a high density of outlets in an area um, affect health and well-being. And, you know, quite often we only think about the availability or the ease of access to these products, um, that, you know, because there are more of them sold in our neighbourhoods, it's easier to, to get them. But there's also the idea that if they're kind of in close proximity to each other, there will be a reduction in prices, some price competition, and also just that they reinforce and, um, and shape our social norms and our attitudes towards alcohol. And, um, and I think um, within Scotland that that's also incredibly important, that just, you know, teenagers, for example, um, will, their, their ideas and um, attitudes towards alcohol will be shaped if we're living in a society um, which is um, swimming with, it, with alcohol. Do you want to share? <coughs> come in there. 
capacity is a very vexed issue, not just for health and the, the, the trade, but also for licensing boards. Um, on sale premises, the numbers that are given, the total capacity is virtually meaningless because it changes from hour to hour. It changes depending on the layout of a function room, how many tables and chairs are in it, how big the dance floor is. But even in relation to off sales capacity is not straightforward. Sometimes it's measured in cubic metres, sometimes it's measured in metres square, sometimes it's the floor space with the shelves on it, sometimes it's just the shelves. Um, so there's, there's been no clear steer for licensing boards from the beginning on what capacity means, both in terms of on-sales and off-sales. Um, officers uh, in Solar would be concerned about the proposals in the bill to bring licensed hours into the equation as well, because not every premises trades the full hours that they have on their licences. Sometimes they have um, their open um, for shorter hours, they close during quiet times. So what meaningful um, information does that bring to the table? Um, we are as vexed as licensing board clerks and licensing boards as everybody else is as to how to make over provision work. Um, but certainly capacity needs some clarification about how that's to be taken into account in determining whether there's over provision. And it's not as straightforward as you think because of all these technical issues that we have to deal with. Just in the Ms Stewart, you made reference to cubic metres, cubic square feet, and all the rest of it in terms of the, the situation in floor space and, and off sales. Does any account taken of the amount of storage space that that premises may have? Because while you're saying the restriction is in terms of what's in front of the customer when they walk in, then the storage, you know, as the example I gave of the, the tonic wine being sold, no, there might only be one shelf full of tonic wine being sold or in display, but there may be you know, 20 cases sitting in a storeroom that basically gets replenished every time somebody buys two bottles of tonic wine. Storage is not, generally speaking, taken into account at the current time. It's purely the alcohol displays within the store. Mr Cummins, you want to come yes. in? If I may say so, I think that's a point that's often overlooked. The real capacity mm -hmm. uh, is not what's in the shelf. In fact, it's not even the capacity, because capacity is the amount of space given over in terms of the Act for the display of alcohol for sale on the premises. The length and height isn't the capacity. It's a, it's a two-dimensional measurement. But uh, again, this isn't a society's position, but my personal view has always been that the real capacity is what you've got in the back shop that you can use to refill the shelves whenever that authorised space starts to, to, to run down. I think that is often overlooked. Uh, I entirely agree, if I may say so, with Ms Stewart in relation to licensed hours being part of the overprovision uh, uh, assessment because they may or may not be used. And I don't think that they contribute anything at all, nor does the society, to a better understanding of what would constitute overprovision. So we're, we're agreed in that. Mark McDonald, please. Uh, two, two points, Convener. I think, um, firstly, on the issue around storage space, I'm quite interested by that. Um, when I used to work in the dim and distant past for a, a major supermarket chain, who shall go unnamed, um, all of the alcohol had to be stored in a sort of locked cage at the back of the warehouse. I don't know if that was as a result of regulation or, or, or if that was just a, a choice that was made. Warehouses were normally open yeah. in these circumstances, yeah. from the, my this, experience, the, the, the same yeah. kind of stores. The, the second point, and it follows on from, I think, an interesting point that, that Mr Steele made around the pressures that are caused by large numbers of venues in a concentrated area spilling out at the same time. When I was a local authority councillor, I floated a suggestion that local authority licensing boards should look at implementing what I would call uh, cool-down periods, where the, the, there was a differentiation between the... the the sale of uh, alcohol and the closing time of the premises, or uh, a differentiation around the closing time of premises across a certain area. Now, neither of those are necessarily perfect solutions, but are those provisions that are available to licensing boards already? Would there be legal implications for them if they were to implement such proposals? Th those kind of things are things I'd be interested in learning a bit more about, because I'm by no means an expert. Mr Cummins? Yes, well, licensing boards implement policies that we usually provide for different terminal hours, depending on the type of premises. Um, in Glasgow, for example, the terminal hour in the city centre for pubs, if you like, is 12 o'clock. Uh, for restaurants, meeting certain criteria, it's 1 o'clock. For nightclubs, it's 3 o'clock. So it's different... Um, throughout, uh, it's different throughout the country. Uh, but uh, yes, the, the point about a large bust of people onto the street 
at the one time and the stress it causes uh, was one of the reasons why capacity became for the first time a feature of licensing legislation in 2005. Uh, the Nicholson Committee, whom you probably know, reviewed licensing law in the run-up to that Act, noted that uh, a licence was a licence, but a super pub, if you like, could have much more trading space than a small traditional pub, uh, but it was still counted as one licence. So that from the Nicholson point of view, over-provision was very much linked to um, stress levels caused by a large number of people coming onto the street in a concentrated area late at night, and of course that has police resource implications. But certainly differentiating between different types of premises, there is a staggering, staggered closing time, I think, probably throughout all of Scotland. It goes go slightly further than that. Though. So, for example, if you have a street... Um, uh, let's take Justice Mill Lane in Aberdeen, where there are a large number of premises which all empty at 3 o'clock in the morning uh, in a concentrated area. The, the suggestion I had floated was that you could differentiate licences across those venues, um, either at the closing time of the premise or the time at which alcohol ceases to be sold versus the closing time of the premise. I'm asking whether those kind of variations locally can be made by licensing boards at present or whether you see legal difficulty for them in, in taking uh, that step. Uh, before I take back, Mr Cummins, could you, could you maybe add to that? Because my understanding of, of when that has happened in certain places is that there have been challenge, challenges in the courts between rival premi premises owners uh, about who should uh, close earlier and who should be allowed to open later. Would that be...? Well, yes. I mean, just to, just to take... Uh, first off, I mean, the, the point about differentiation... Uh, let's look at Western Bartonshire Licensing Board as a model. It was the first licensing board to declare almost all of its area overprovided, it split into data zones. And I think I'm right in saying that 15 out of 17 data zones are overprovided. But overprovision only resists, exists in relation to what might be called vertical drinking establishments and off-sales. So that not caught by the overprovision policy and looked at in the normal way would be hotels and, and restaurants. Uh, importantly, I think that policy has revised a couple of years ago, now allows, license, now allows the licensing board to look at the benefits from inward investment for the economy and the health improvements that might be related by people putting into work. But I think the, the short answer is there can be a differentiation. You could say, for example, we are not having any more off-sales. Uh, Highland Licensing Board recently has said we're not having any more off-sales with a display capacity in excess of 40 square metres which is quite an innovative step. So there's all sorts of refinements that, that, are, that, that are possible, if, if that helps. I, I think the difficulty um, that boards often face uh, is when uh, owners challenge uh, the decisions in court, saying, um, look, the boy up the road is allowed to open until one o'clock in the morning. Why am I not allowed to do so too? Um, and I, I think, you know... Um, that's where the difficulties uh, have arisen, certainly in my patch in the past. Does the bill help in that regard? Or well, are we still going to have uh, sheriffs who are going to overrule licensing boards on a, a day and daily basis? I think, I think the, the, the situation is that if a licensing board has got a policy that a certain type of premises will be able to open to a certain time, and somebody tries to bring themselves within that policy, the disgruntled license holder that you've described, and they, they want to challenge it, they would have to have a very large checkbook um, and lots of money because litigating and licensing is a phenomenally expensive uh, business. I, I happen to know, without putting in the spot, Ms Stewart has some experience of <laughs> litigation from nightclubs, so I don't know whether she's able to assist this convener. Um, Ms Stewart? Or perhaps, perhaps I misremember a bit. I think you're misremembering. Oh, right. <laughs> um, take that question. What, what? I think what licensing boards are faced with is the trade wants a level playing field. So the pubs want to operate the same hours across the board, the, the nightclubs across the board, whatever those hours may be that the licensing boards put into place. I think for differentiation, it would be very difficult to pick which ones are going to lose their hours. You would have to look at new premises coming in and then you're going to get the argument, well, we tick all the boxes, why aren't we getting the same hours as the pub next door? So unless there's a specific problem relating to individual premises upon which the board can review and if hours are found to be causing a problem or capacity, you can take action in relation to the specific premises, I think it, it would put boards into a very difficult position um, when the, the, the evidence that boards are getting is we want to be treated the same, we want a fair shot 
at, at the market, um, and, and that's overwhelmingly the, the, the evidence that's been coming before the boards for a long time. Okay. Which is why you'll see policies that say pubs will open till one, nightclubs open till three. And I know that um, some boards previously had curfews in place to try and control disorder, but I think Highland are the latest board to lift their curfew um, because the reasons for implementation are simply no longer there. Okay. Alec Rowley, please. Yeah, I mean, Convener, I think it would be useful to get um, the research that, that Dr Short um, talked about and it would be useful to see that, but also perhaps any other links um, that are there to other research. Um, and also any other experiences. I know in some European countries, for example, you just can't go to the corner shop and, and buy alcohol. But I wonder, convener, if I can, if I can maybe um, switch my questions a bit back Certainly. to the, their weapons. Yep. Um, and, and if I can specifically pick up with, with Callum Steele. Um, in the financial memorandum that, that, that goes with the bill, um, the Scottish Government state that the main costs falling to Police Scotland will arise from the initial certification of the air weapon holders and ongoing checks and renewals of certificates once the main regime is in place. But it then goes on to say, to a great extent, um, all of the main elements of the regime are already in place. So, so, so the financial memorandum does not um, consider that there will be um, major costs involved. I mean, you seem to be saying something different to that. Callum, can you answer that from a federation perspective? Uh, I can give my view from a federation perspective, yeah. certainly. Um, I think I'll start by saying uh, that uh, we find that, that it is not uncommon that the governments of whatever hue traditionally underestimate the cost of anything that they're introducing. Uh, and that the costs end up being borne largely by the service that, uh, uh, that's got responsibility for it, be it licensing services for uh, uh, alcohol licensing or uh, police, police service for uh, firearms licensing. The, the difficulty that the Scottish Police Federation has with the, uh, with the financial memorandum and indeed the, the, the comments from within it are that there's, there's a lot of comments and a lot of suggestion but no evidence as to why those comments have been made or how the conclusions have been reached. Uh, I mean, f for example, the the suggestion that um, you know that there are uh, 40, there may be 40,000 uh, air weapons uh, currently held by firearm or shotgun certificate holders, uh, many of whom will hold more than one. There's no indication as to why that statement is made or what evidence supports that kind of uh, what kind of that, that kind of approach. And also the uh, the, the real uh, difficulty in trying to quantify uh, how uh, what our experience is and the number of staff that undertake these activities on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, how that translates into uh, a limited um, amount of inquiry based on a small number of individuals when there has been no guidance prepared as to what is going to be required by way of uh, background check supporting evidence before an air weapons certificate is granted. Um, so just that I, I suspect that uh, uh, others will, uh, uh, will express a similar view, but just because statements are made uh, does not mean that they are true. There should be some kind of evidence to support uh, uh, the basis for the statement in the first place. And at a time when uh, everyone in the public sector is uh, under considerable pressure, uh, and whether people admit it or not, there is undoubtedly a conversation taking place about whether there should be fewer police officers in Scotland. Uh, it seems to me that this is not something that should be taken, uh, this is not something that can be globally dismissed as having little impact on the police service. Uh, you speak to any uh, police officer that's involved in day-to-day uh, -day, uh, response policing, effectively those that answer the call and attend the door, and they will tell you that they are stretched uh, and adding the burden of potentially having to deal with up to half a million air weapons, although it's uh, uh, questionable whether uh, that number would ever fall into the licensing regime, uh, is something that needs to be properly understood. Uh, my uh, organisation's view is that that hasn't been done uh, other than uh, just by the making of bland statements. Dr Whiteman, do you want to come in on that point? Um, I don't think I can add much about the okay. uh, uh, licensing, but it, it, as, as you've said, I'd be interested uh, where the figures of um, uh, half a million uh, air weapons comes from. Okay, Alec, do you want to come back just now? So do we have, <coughs> I mean, do we have any idea at all in terms of how much um, air weapons are actually out there? Is there... Is there a best guess on that? Uh, I don't know uh, on that, I'm afraid. Okay. 
There's uh, also, there's, I see it's also picked up, there's an assumption <coughs> that, that uh, the licensing were to come in for these, these weapons, then there would be people would surrender them and, and, and put them back. I mean, is there a view that, that generally people, many people have their weapons that are just lying about, that actually if they had to get them licensed, they would just hand them back? Amnesty, um, is there many of them? Callum? Every time there's an amnesty, there are a whole number of different weapons that are surrendered. The, we, even now, if, if there was to be an amnesty tomorrow, uh, there would be unlicensed shotguns handed in, there would be unlicensed firearms handed in. It happens time and again. The same thing occurs uh, standard across most of the police services in, uh, uh, in the United Kingdom. So undoubtedly that would, uh, that would be the case. Uh, but whether people have them just lying around in the, in the manner that possibly sitting in a dusty garage somewhere, you know, my experience is, and uh, I can't stress that it is on my own experience, is that yes, that probably is the case. Um, uh, but I suspect that uh, there are as many people uh, hold and use their weapons uh, uh, properly and competently as there are those that have bought them once upon a time and forgotten that they continue to have them. I've got three members on my list now. Could I just Alec, finish giving one? Yeah, briefly. The final one is, we know that, that people who have licenses, hold licenses or apply for licenses for, for shotguns, for example, there's, there's a, 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 a stringent um, process that goes in place, background checks and all the rest of it. This financial memorandum seems to suggest that that, that kind of extensive detailed background checks won't be necessary in terms of... Air licensing, is that, is that is your take on that? Callum? My take on it is that is what the memorandum suggests. Um, there, is, there is indeed a question whether, uh, whether there needs to be the, uh, the additional consideration for uh, licensing for those that currently hold firearm or shotgun certificates. Uh, it, seems, uh, it seems to the Scottish Police Federation, and it seems to me personally, that that would be uh, unusual uh, given uh, and, uh, you know, levels of, uh, levels of um, uh, danger are, are difficult to quantify. If something's lethal, it's lethal regardless. It doesn't matter if you're, uh, doesn't matter if you're bludgeoned to death or whether you're uh, blitzed out of the air with a, with a rocket-propelled grenade, you're still dead. Um, and I suppose the issue of uh, how uh, lethal or otherwise any of these particular weapons would be is something that uh, needs to be uh, properly understood. <coughs> but given that there is a... a, a a very detailed uh, approach taken to the licensing system, particularly for shotguns and, and firearms. Um, it, it seems that there is, if indeed the legislation is to proceed it on this, on, on this uh, particular element, that there is a real uh, easy win uh, in providing the, uh, the capacity on an existing firearm or shotgun certificate to simply hold an air weapon uh, or air weapons. Uh, where the where, of course, your question uh, particularly focuses on is those that wouldn't fall into that kind of category and how much, uh, how much examination would be required in it. If it was to be something akin to the old-fashioned game licence that you went to the post office and just paid for and picked up and walked out the door, then that would be uh, effectively as meaningless as the game licence itself was. Um, and it is, it is not clear, other than an assessment on the individual's application in its own right, what would be subject or who would be subject to, uh, who would be subject to detail application and consideration than, than those that wouldn't. Okay, Mark and then John and then Anne. Mark first. Yeah, uh, it was just obviously the motivation behind licensing in this area is obviously related to uh, both actual and perceived harm. And I'm interested in the study that Dr. Whiteman has done and what he's concluded from that around the, the harm that can be caused by air weapon pellets. Um, and I wonder if you might give us a little bit more detail on that. Dr Whiteman. Are you asking um, about the actual damage that air weapons can do or um, the statistics? Yeah, both, if you want okay. to offer them. Um, as I say, we've been looking at um, firing into, initially firing into ballistic gel to simulate um, uh, the fleshy organs. And then we've uh, looked at um, embedding uh, uh, animal organs from an abattoir into the gel and comparing that with the gel on its own. And um, the ballistic gel is a, re uh, a reasonable model for um, uh, the various uh, soft tissues within the body. Uh, there's obviously a bit of variation between them. Um, lung is, uh, uh, has, uh, it will penetrate uh, more readily than uh, heart material, but it's a reasonable approximation. Um, 
the fact that the pellet will go um, 10, 15 uh, centimetres in, if there's, uh, if there's nothing to, uh, no bone or anything to prevent that, does mean there is the potential for uh, serious injury within the body. Um, we've looked at, uh, say, we've looked at the effect of clothing that can reduce the amount of penetration. Uh, sometimes it, it um, will re uh, reduce it significantly. Other times, uh, uh, it doesn't seem to have so much effect. And uh, we've got a project running this year, looking uh, more into why that occurs. Um, we tried simulating uh, skin, but we've, ha uh, we've had um, difficulty to getting uh, reproducible results. Uh, on that, and as I said in my introduction, you've got a complex system. You've got the, you've got clothing, or potentially you've got clothing. You've got the skin. You've got the uh, fleshy organs. You may have bone behind it. So what we've been trying to do is um, simplify the, uh, the model. Uh, but from the work that we've done, pellets can penetrate quite a distance into the, uh, into the body. Looking at um, the literature from uh, uh, medical journals. Um, most of the, uh, the work on the effect of air weapons has come from uh, doc uh, medical doctors looking at the injuries that have been caused and the fatalities that have been caused uh, uh, by uh, air weapons. And um, that complements what we've been doing. Uh, and there are cases of um, uh, quite serious injuries and fatalities from, uh, from air weapons. OK, the uh, numbers uh, have been declining uh, within the UK as have with other um, firearms as well but uh, it's still a uh, significant number Okay, um, John please Thank you, Convener uh, Just to start off with Mr Steele uh, you indicated in terms of the, in your submission the costs may be underestimated in terms of implementing uh, the licensing regime for air weapons Could you comment on what you think may be the costs to enforce the legislation, because I'm talking about those individuals who do not decide to license or be, become licensed to hold air weapons, uh, do, would you see the police then being involved in a major exercise to try and get as many unlicensed weapons uh, off the, the streets as possible? Uh, and whether or not, at the present time, the only real time the police come in to, uh, to interact with illegal use of their weapons is when there is an illegal activity taking place or a perceived illegal activity taking place. Mr Steele. Yeah, thank you, Convener. The, the, the issue of um, compliance costs is detailed in paragraph 76, and there's a suggestion in that paragraph that uh, the Police Service of Scotland should not uh, pursue air weapons as a, um, air weapon of, uh, as a significant priority, but rather deal with the, the issues as and when they occur. The, as and when they occur. Uh, I suppose the question of cost has probably got to be broken down into three areas. There's the financial cost, there's the human cost in terms of the impact on uh, communities and the individuals, and of course there is the, the, the time spent by police officers in, engaged in dealing with it. Um, and I, I think it would be uh, helpful to try and uh, spend some time on each of those things. The financial costs will ultimately only be identified once the process has worked through to the end, and I think it's going to be really difficult to, to, lay, a, uh, to lay an answer on that. Uh, but I do believe that uh, some of the things that contribute to the financial cost will be uh, an inevitable increase in licensing offences being identified uh, and will undoubtedly end up being reported to the Procurator Fiscal Service, will undoubtedly impact on the time the Procurator Fiscal Service has to dedicate to dealing with these things and indeed uh, may ultimately translate into court time as well. Now, all of these things in terms of court, Procurator Fiscal uh, reporting time all have uh, a considerable drain on police time to, to service them. I can't think that uh, it would be acceptable to uh, the legislature or to uh, our communities that if these offences existed, that the police were to take a view uh, that uh, Joe Soap uh, maybe, just, maybe was just forgetful, but someone else who they didn't like the look of their jib uh, was going to get reported for it uh, uh, and take an inconsistent view. So I think that is, uh, is problematic. And then there's the, the human cost in terms of uh, how it impacts on individuals. Uh, I suspect that there are many, uh, tens, of, tens of hundreds, thousands possibly, which is the same thing, obviously, uh, uh, possibly tens of thousands of uh, individuals out there who may well find themselves falling foul of the, 
uh, of the criminal justice system because of licensing offences, something that's never uh, featured before. And that's just not for individuals that are domiciled in Scotland. It could also apply to individuals that come from uh, uh, anywhere uh, else in the United Kingdom. Uh, to Scotland where there are no uh, uh, current considerations for uh, moving uh, air weapons across the, uh, across the borders. Uh, and uh, whilst I consider that in the early days the potential of a prosecution or a recorded prosecution or a fixed penalty disposal being, uh, being brought against someone will be uh, regarded as uh, relatively minor, um, it's the potential or impact on these individuals later in their lives, you know, if we find a young person, uh, 18, 19 year old who uh, falls foul or later in their lives going for employment or trying to get jobs overseas uh, when the, the, you know, the, the global marketplace changes so quickly and competition for jobs is, uh, is, is so vehement could have quite a devastating impact on their, uh, on, on their future life chances. And I think that needs to be properly understood, uh, uh, understood as well. Um, and, um, in the intervening period where there is going to be this large suggested period of uh, non-active pursuance, if you like, uh, and indeed uh, whether there are going to be uh, enormous uh, quantities of air weapons handed in for surrender, the transportation and the physical seizure recording uh, and holding of, uh, of, of these weapons until such time as they are uh, taken away, if indeed they are to be taken away uh, by a, a scrap metal dealer, uh, are really difficult to uh, really difficult uh, uh, to estimate, but I do think that, um, as I've said before, the statements that have been made uh, seem to be based on no evidence other than just possibly a finger in the air that this seems about right. Uh, well, until such time as we know, first of all, until such time as we've got a reasonable grasp of what's out there, um, a reasonable gauge of how many current certificate holders. Uh, would fall within the, the ambit of, uh, of, being, of being considered and indeed how long it's going to take, I think it's going to be really, really difficult to uh, accurately predict that the, the cost to the service is going to be negligible. I mean, in, in time alone, uh, particularly in the, in the more rural areas, the highlands in particular, there's a, there's a reference in our uh, submission. So this has to be very brief, it's very, very brief, brief answer. It's just in terms of an, an earlier answer Mr Steele gave. He said when there's a weapons amnesty, there are a number of unregistered shotguns and firearms are submitted. Could you give, maybe not today, but could you give the committee an indication of how many unregistered shotguns and firearms have been submitted in weapons amnesties in the past. I think that would be difficult for Mr Steele, but we'll get that but, information from Police Scotland, I think. Uh, yeah. Indeed, convener, yeah. OK. Uh, Anne? Mr. Convener, um, and still on that same note, Mr. Steele, about the you also had mentioned in your submission about the ICT systems, um, about that trying to absorb um, the extra, the additional data, which may be created um, by the introduction of the licensing system for air weapons. Can you explain what you were meaning by that, Mr. Steele? Can you be quite brief, please? I'll, I'll try to be brief. I'm, I'm, not, run, I'm not running for it, but I'll give it a go. Um, the, our IT systems are, as everybody knows, not the best. Uh, the, they have not been tested to deal with uh, the potential increase in, uh, increase in ent entries that will be required, database entries. Uh, and as a consequence, it would be difficult to uh, uh, accurately predict how much uh, an IT provider, uh, which would recognise that the service is something of a hostage to fortune, uh, would, be, uh, uh, would be wanting to charge a service to make sure that it does have the capacity to deal with the additional data that it would require to hold. Okay, Stuart, please. Uh, thank you very much, Um Just, I've heard obviously the evidence has been set up to now, um, and going back to some of the evidence that we received, we received the evidence from Michael Flynn of the SSPCA, uh, where he stated uh, that, certainly within the UK, uh, the many activities which require to be licensed, such as driving a car or watching television, and that UK citizens do not have the right to bear arms. Now, certainly also within the, the UK at the moment, uh, in terms of a TV licence, um, it is a, a criminal offence, uh, and uh, it could lead to a court appearance and a fine of up to £1,000. And uh, many, this, this is day one of this bill uh, being looked at. And many people outside of here may consider the fact that they could be charged uh, for not having a TV licence, 
but if there was no uh, similar uh, scheme and operation for air weapons, then they might find that quite strange. Yeah. Uh, Mr Steele. Yeah, thank you, Convener. I, I suppose that comes back to the very essence of what it is that this particular element of the bill is trying to deal with. Is it trying to create a licensing regime for air weapons, or is it trying to deal with the criminal use of air weapons? If it's the former, then by all means introduce the legislation and uh, create offences that bring those that breach the licensing provisions before the court on a regular basis, because I suspect uh, it will be a regular basis. But if it is to deal with the latter, the criminal use of air weapons, then I, uh, I, I, I rather fear that those that are criminally inclined to use air weapons, in much the same ways as there are those that are criminally inclined to use uh, firearms and shotguns, will continue to be criminally inclined to use them, regardless of the licensing <laughs> regime. So if, uh, if the intention is to license, and uh, have the, the availability of, uh, of air weapons uh, managed through a licensing system, then by all means, absolutely in the same way as uh, you have to drive a car with a license or uh, watch television with a license, then, uh, yeah, uh, introduce the licensing system. But if it's to deal with the criminality, uh, then that's a different thing altogether. Because let's not forget that whilst there may well be a licensing requirement uh, to watch television or a, right, or a licensing requirement to drive a car, there are many people that don't. Uh, have licences because they are criminally inclined not to do that. Okay. Can I move on um, uh, to taxes? And uh, Ms Stewart, for many of us, we get uh, quite a lot of complaints uh, about the taxi licensing um, regime. Um, the bill itself proposals tightening regulations so that opportunities for circumventing the licensing regime are reduced, is one of the statements that is, uh, is there. Um, and yet we see the rise of companies like Uber, um, who will come and pick folk up and all of the rest. How does the bill, or does the bill, tackle these uh, uh, kind of situations? Or are we going to have to rethink this even more in the future? Um, having recently been in a meeting with some Scottish Government representatives to discuss the issue of Uber and applications like that, um, I think we may have to rethink, to a certain regard, um, unlicensed operators in some parts of the country are not that prevalent. Um, there, there's the ongoing um, tension between the taxi trade and the private hire trade that's always been there. Um, but any provision of law would make it a criminal offence not to have a licence. So the majority of taxi firms that operate are licensed. Um, Uber, I think, is opening us to a whole different world, but it doesn't take away from the legislation that we currently have, that if you operate a taxi or a private hire car, you need a licence to do it. I'm not sure what, that we've reached a stage where we can resolve or solve the problem that Uber and similar applications are going to represent. Okay. And, um, and this part of the bill um, covering taxis and private hire cars, um, are uh, Solar's licensing working group satisfied or is there anything else? We're concerned about the, the proposed limits on private hire cars um, and the differences in, in restricting, restri restricting numbers where taxis is currently unmet demand. Um, you're proposing to introduce over provision for private hire cars. Um, we'd be concerned that it may lead to um, value of plates in the similar way that some taxi plates have a value um, and it may not it may not achieve the desired result uh, in the end Cameron? thank you thank you very much Kavita. do you think that uber has been banned in other countries because the taxi drivers are afraid of the competition what would be why has it been banned in germany for example it's been there's a temporary ban on it. I am not aware of the reasons why Germany banned it. I, I'm only aware of the concerns of the London taxi right. cabs. Um, the, I don't think the meeting that we had went into that level of detail. It, it's how do we deal with the operators that are going to quote prices online. You will have a car that will come in and pick you up. They're, they're self-employed Apparently, they're not employed by Uber. Um, therefore, um, the person booking that, that car doesn't know if that's a licensed vehicle or an unlicensed vehicle, and nobody's taking responsibility for those that don't have licenses. And there's a problem with third-party insurance, presumably, yes. then, is there? Yeah. 
Yeah, okay. and obviously the implications of that if there's an incident. Okay. I'm told that the, the ban was in Berlin only and the courts have overturned that ban. But I think the difficulty mm. that you've just identified there is that many folks who are using um, these kind of services don't realise that they're unlicensed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and I think that's uh, the difficulty for, for us because, you know, we've had incidents before um, in Scotland where folk have gone into taxi, uh, cars thinking they were taxis or private hire car, only to find they're not, and then serious incidents taking place. So I think, you know, we've got to get that absolutely right. Um, can I thank you all very much um, for your evidence today? I realise that's a, a fairly lengthy session um, your input is very much appreciated um, and it may well be um, that the clerks will get back to you uh, to clarify various points uh, and to seek further information. Um, I suspend now for a change of witnesses.
Um, thank you very much. I'd now let, like to welcome our second panel this morning, uh, Dr Colin Shedden, Chair, British Association for Shooting and Con Conservation, John Batley, Director of the Gun Trade Association, David John Penn, British Shoot Shooting Sports Council, and Graham Ellis, Chair of the Scottish Air Rifle and Pistol Association. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. Good morning to you. Uh, would you like to make any brief opening statements at all? Mr. Batley. <coughs> well, we were, we were all together on the, the Firearms Consultative Panel, and all those, the minutes of all those deliberations are on record, and we have worked consistently with the Scottish Government over the last three years looking at the aspects of the bill and we've all answered the various we've put in submissions on the provisions of the bill okay anyone else want to make any brief statement okay if i could start the questioning then uh, obviously we already have a licensing regime for shotguns and other firearms why should air weapons be treated any differently dr shedden would you like to start off uh, yes um we have, over a considerable number of decades, um, built up a system whereby um, licensing has been introduced for firearms and shotguns, as you rightly identify. We haven't had licensing for air guns at all. And the problem that I think we're faced with is the fact that there are an estimated minimum of 500,000 air guns in Scotland. The vast majority of them do not have a serial number, unlike the vast majority of shotguns and other firearms. And consequently, to introduce a licensing regime from a fresh is unlikely to be successful, I would argue, because the only people who would submit themselves to a regime like that would be law-abiding, people who wish to remain law-abiding. Um, it has been identified in the previous session that there's a criminal element that may not actually put themselves forward. So the question has to be, will a licensing system address criminal misuse of air guns, or will a licensing system basically introduce a licensing system for its own sake? Mr. Penn? Thank you. Uh, one has to remember that there is widespread continuing use of, uh, of air weapons in pony clubs, boy scouts, cadet units, and so on, as well as the individual use of them. And we never hear about this. Why? Because nothing is going wrong. There is a huge amount of use of air weapons and very, very little misuse in comparison. Uh, most other countries do not see the need to license air weapons. For instance, the European Directive on Weapons Control excludes air weapons from its remit. So you have to remember that the air weapon of the sort we're talking about, under, under 12 foot pounds over one joule, is really designed for urban use. It's designed for use in the garden, in the home, because it is not very powerful. Uh, Mr Ellis. Just uh, to reiterate what Colin said, that um, of our membership and of the people who actively shoot air guns, um, there is a little or no criminal element. Um, introdu the introduction of a, a licensing system will force people to go down that route and probably migrate onto other sports. Um, and we are concerned that it does little or nothing to address the, the criminal element who would misuse air guns. Mr. Batley. <clears throat> yes, so the only thing I would add is that since 1969, when the rules were introduced for setting the power of air weapons, uh, the whole of England and Wales, leaving aside Northern Ireland and up to this point Scotland, have had no licensing system in place whatsoever for the presumed reason, and I believe correct reason, that there was no need for licensing of low-powered air weapons. I'm going to make a small admission here. There was no criminality involved, I should say. Um, but when I was a, a young boy, as I'd said earlier, I was in the Air Cadets yeah. and uh, enjoyed shooting a fair bit, it has to be said. Um, a, a friend of mine's father, um, who also uh, was a shooter, um, had a, a variety uh, of, of uh, uh, firearms. Uh, none of which we could ever have gained access to because he was always very careful about all of that. However, there was also an air rifle in that house uh, which uh, we managed to get hold of quite easily uh, and go out and uh, shoot about a little bit. As I say, no criminality. But there seems to be a, a difference in terms of uh, that level of responsibility 
where a man held a, a, a firearms licence and was very, very careful in terms of, of, of that weaponry that he, he, he had, but was less bothered um, about the air rifle itself. Do you think that a, a, a licensing regime uh, would, would ensure um, that there was uh, more responsibility in that regard of, of safeguarding those weapons? I should say that we were 13 and 14 at the time. Um, <coughs> probably more responsible than, than many uh, that were about then. Yeah, indeed, um, licensing is unnecessary in the context that you've just described, because current legislation now um, states that it would be an offence to allow anyone under the age of 18 unauthorised access to an air weapon. So those who have air weapons in the House now have an obligation to either secure it under lock and key or certainly out of the reach of young people. And that inevitably has had a significant impact on the number of offences committed by young people because they now technically should not be able to access air weapons um, in that situation. Uh, does anybody else want to come in on that? No. Uh, Mark Macdonald, please. Yeah. I just want to pick up on the, the point, convener. Oh. The microphone's not. There it is. Um, I just want to pick up on the point that, that's been made a couple of times now about there, there will always be this element who will circumvent legislation that is put in place. Surely the point of putting legislation in place is that it allows you to differentiate easily between the law abiding and the law breaking. Otherwise, there would be no point in legislating on anything because the argument would always be put, well, if you legislate on this, there will always be a tiny minority who are going to circumvent that legislation. Surely the, the point is that we allow uh, ourselves to differentiate between those who are law-abiding and law-breaking by introducing legislation. Mr. Batley, do you want to go first in that? that but <clears throat> I think the point about this is this is an entirely new departure. This has never, ever been done before. This is the first time anywhere in the UK that a bill has been introduced to licence air weapons. In looking at it in overall, we have something like 7 million air weapons between 4 million owners within the UK. This is a completely new departure. We are in uncharted waters, and the bill that you have prepared sets out to deal with that. And I don't think I need to go any further than that, in actual fact. It's not the bill that we have prepared. It's uh, the bill, bill from I do the beg your pardon. Um, Mr Ellis. Uh, the, sorry. As far as the criminality goes, there's a raft of legislation which we see actively used day in, day out to prosecute those who would use air weapons criminally. Um, those who currently use it as a sport or as a pastime or as vermin control would fundamentally not have a major issue with this, but what they would have an issue with is the, the proportionality of it and the potential criminalisation of what was formerly a perfectly legitimate pastime. Mr Penn. I think one has to remember the point made by the Scottish Police Federation that a licensing system per se will not be very likely immediately to flush out those who are criminally inclined. They will just stay quiet, not be licensed. They will be come across because they have committed some act. And then they will be prosecuted. But there's plenty of law existing now to effectively prosecute people who misuse air weapons. The licensing of them would not help very much. It would add another stick to beat them with, but there's a whole raft of sticks already available. Dr Shaden. Uh, in an ideal world, what you suggested um, it would uh, be very... Uh, very sensible. But the proposal that we have in front of us is that Police Scotland will put the resource into uh, administering a licensing scheme and they will not put any priority resource into identifying those who may uh, be in illegal possession of such air guns. So as I say, if resources weren't an issue and if uh, police numbers weren't an issue, then it would be ideal if we could have licensing and the police investigation into those that may be committing uh, offences by being in illegal possession. But we're not in that position. And the other point I'd make, obviously, is that the number of offences involving air weapons has declined considerably over the last um, six years. And the strategy that's been in place, which is a, 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 a joint strategy between Scottish Government, Police Scotland and the shooting organisations, is one of education and enforcement of existing legislation. And I did note that uh, the Justice Cabinet Secretary used these very words when he supported um, a new strategy for knife crime in the west of Scotland, which was um, education and enforcement of existing legislation. 
Martin McDonald, do you want to come back? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've looked through the submissions and they, and they range from, um, you know, um, in terms of the range of uses that there are out there that the air weapons are, are, are utilised for, um, be it from uh, pastimes to pest control. Um, where do you perceive that the issues are going to arise in terms of people being prevented from using air weapons as a result of this scheme? Or, um, I mean, is, th is that the concern that you have, that people are going to be prevented from using air weapons for pastimes as a result of a licensing regime? Because it's Do not my interpretation of what's Dr. intended. Dr Shedden, first of all, please. Yes, um, there are a number of good reasons given for um, the granting of an air weapons certificate, and they seem quite comprehensive. But I think we have to recognise that what the British Shooting Sports Council has done has identified that the vast majority of people using air weapons in Scotland and in the rest of the UK will use them for informal target shooting in gardens, otherwise otherwise known as plinking, and while the bill itself doesn't prohibit plinking, um, the policy memorandum states that ministers uh, would not normally accept uh, shooting in domestic gardens, for instance, as being good reason. So it concerns us enormously that a significant number of the owners of, uh, fire, of air weapons just now could be um, prohibited from getting a licence because they cannot provide good reason. They don't have access to a large area of ground or they're not members of clubs. Anyone else want to come in on that one? No. I support that view. Okay. Mark. And final question, Camina. I'm, I'm just checking that I've picked up the the Gun Trade Association's submission correctly. That they appear to be suggesting that if somebody comes to Scotland from a place where the age for uh, the, where they are below the age of the licence, um, that there should be an exemption made for them because they can have an air weapon in. Uh, in their country at that age, but they can't have an air weapon under the licensing regime as applied. Just, have I picked that up correctly? Mr. Yes, Batley. absolutely. Okay. Um, it's just because it strikes me that there are a range of areas where age differentiation occurs. One of the most obvious ones is around purchase of alcohol. So to, to the logical extension of that argument would be that if somebody comes to Scotland from a country where the age to purchase alcohol is lower than it is in Scotland, we should allow them to be served in pubs because they can do that at home. Mr. Which Bat strikes me as, you know, yes, I believe there's a slight consistent. difference here. The young person who is coming to Scotland, shall we say below the age of 18, who wishes to purchase an air weapon, and let's assume that he can purchase one at 16 in his own country, what the bill says is that he cannot receive that air weapon whilst he's in Scotland. It has to be sent to him. So in other words, he can't take possession of that air weapon while he's in Scotland. If I, I contest that if he was allowed to buy it in his own country and he's in Scotland, he just happens to be in Scotland, but he's not going to take possession of it. So therefore, if he's allowed to buy it in his own country at 16 and it's going to be sent to his own country, which it will be, according to the bill, I see no reason why he shouldn't be allowed to purchase it. If he was allowed to take it away and take possession of it, I agree with what the bill says. But I do believe that he should be allowed to purchase it. Okay. Uh, Cameron Buchanan, please. Thank you very much. We've had an interesting submission from the Scottish Tetrathlon Society saying that the majority of our members are under 17 and as such their air weapons would have a, licensing would have a huge effect on them. If, however, we were allowed to become an approved air weapons club, therefore we'd be, could we be exempt from the individual licenses? You know, could we have an individual licence for an air weapons club? Also, it affects sporting activities, doesn't it, if we have shootings. So could we... Are you in favour of putting in an individual... Because most of them are under between 14 and 17, I think they said. Would you put in a special clause on that? There are a Mr. number Ellis. of issues are around youth shooting, because, you, like you correctly identified, you've got triathlon, you've got pony club, you've got air training course, scouts. There's a whole plethora of youth organisations which use shooting as a, as a pastime or a sport. The regulation of the facilities is fine where you use a dedicated facility, but a lot of our events, for example, triathlon, take over various things. And the licensing of a club brings in certain concerns. Um, does it apply to private clubs where you have got a closed membership to licensed individuals? Are you trying to cater for the general public? Or are you trying to cater for specific groups? Um, so licensing of a club, whilst probably it may be beneficial, has got a bunch of pitfalls around them. Cameron? Would this not be a compromise point that the officially 
clubs could be, comp could be licensed if it was an air weapons club for either sporting activities or pony club or whatever it is. And that would be the compromise for age. And they, the license would be held by the club and, and the actual weapons would be held by the club rather than individually. I think the concern was that the, the license, as stated in the bill, was from the facility uh, as opposed to the club. Mm. Um, licensing of a club in itself is not a major problem. Um, it may impact the, those who don't belong to a club who compete, um, like triathlon, pony club, who may hold air weapons and will still require a licence. So it, it's a trade-off on, on benefits, I guess. Anyone else want to come in on that? Mr Penn. Yes. Well, what we're asking for here effectively mirrors what exists with approved rifle clubs for cartridge firearms, where the club can hold a club certificate and its members may shoot them, the rifles, without having a firearm certificate themselves. So it's already a, a well-established practice in club shooting and causes no problems. But, sorry, but it would have to be on licensed premises. It wouldn't be an individual. People couldn't, wouldn't practice in their gardens, for example. They'd have to practice on the, on the premises of the particular group or pony club or... To them. Not, not necessarily, because uh, it, the existing approved club system allows for a club to exist which does not have its own range so it uses other people's premises or MOD ranges. Well, that, yeah, that, sorry, that, that's understood. I mean, obviously, they wouldn't necessarily have their own premises. But I mean, if they went on sporting events like, you know, when you go trap shooting for, for the Olympics or whatever it is like that, they could presumably um, use the premises of the society or club that they're at. Indeed. Mm, OK, thank okay. you. Um, Stuart McMillan, please. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, gentlemen. Um, Dr Shedden, in your comments earlier, um, you mentioned... <coughs> oh, sorry, it's actually... It's, it's gone. I'll come back to you in a moment. It was just something that you mentioned. Um, um, yeah, it'll come back to me. Uh, the next question is regarding the, the issue of the, the plinking. Uh, actually, the, the plinking it takes place in Scotland and... Uh, and whether there's a, there actually is a clear divide between rural and urban areas uh, as to where this actually takes place. Um, I grew up in a, in a, in a housing scheme uh, and uh, it wasn't something that I was certainly aware of um, actually in the area that I grew up in. You weren't aware of plinking. Uh, Dr oh. Sheridan. Yes, uh, plinking does, does occur. It may not occur in areas where gardens are relatively small, but it is relatively common where gardens are large. And what concerns me is that there's a sort of sizest element creeping into this, and it probably is financial as well. So if you live in a large uh, leafy suburb with a large garden, then inevitably the police will think that that's a suitable place for an air rifle to be used, either for controlling rabbits or pigeons or squirrels or rats or for, for informal target shooting. But if you have a relatively small garden, um, it may be deemed unsuitable. And that's certainly what the policy memorandum states. And the advantage of air weapons, as we've already discussed, is that they are relatively low power and can be used in confined spaces for both pest control and for target shooting. And in lots of situations, you can safely set up a small range in a small garden and safely use that air rifle for your own informal target shooting. And as I said before, that is probably what the majority of people with air rifles in Scotland and the rest of the UK actually do. I hope that would be grey squirrels only. Um, Indeed. Anyone else want to come in, gentlemen? Mr. Mr. Batley. That, and in most circumstances, young people start their informal target shooting within the confines of their own premises. And normally, and most often, I believe, they are supervised either by a guardian or a parent. So what we're doing is introducing people to shooting and introducing people through air gun shooting. And as Colin says, they're relatively low powered items. And they have good discipline and they're taught good safety. So there doesn't seem to be a problem with the actual size of the place where they're doing it, providing the supervisor, who will have the certificate, because the young person probably won't at that point, the supervisor has been proved to be a fit person and has good reason. And a good reason is shooting on their own premises. There is a considerable legislation in place, like the Antisocial Behaviour Act, which doesn't allow one to shoot outside the premises, one's own premises or the boundaries of the, of the premises. And there are quite a lot of legislation which protects the public therein. And it is, we're mainly concerned with the fact that this is an introduction to air gun shooting, which we would lose if the, this piece of legislation is too draconian. Stuart? Okay. Um, <clears throat> certainly for Mr. Batley, I mean, you mentioned uh, that you feel as if you would lose this. So uh, are you suggesting then that there would be an adverse effect 
uh, upon the sport of uh, shooting uh, if this legislation were to go ahead? If we're not clear about where these air weapons can be used, quite possibly. If it is too restrictive, you're going to restrict people to joining clubs, and as far as I understand it, there are not a great number of clubs in Scotland, and not everybody has access to private land. So therefore, they probably have to start their shooting, their air gun shooting, within the confines of their own premises. Okay, so there would be, there could well be a restriction, and we could lose people to shooting. Okay. Um, Dr. Shedden. Uh, the or you could increase people, uh, the amount of people uh, who come to shooting if there were more clubs in Scotland. That's a possibility, is it not? Yes, it is indeed. A yeah. sorry, sorry about that, Stuart. Sure. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Shedden. Uh, in your comments earlier, uh, you highlighted uh, in terms of the current regulations uh, with, uh, with looking after uh, the weapons. Uh, what, was your organisation supportive of the, of the current regulations when they, were, uh, when they went through the, uh, the, the particular process at the time? Uh, the, the legislation that I referred to was the one that um, compelled owners of air weapons to ensure that those under age couldn't, couldn't access them. And it's something that our code of practice has always advocated, that while there's no legal requirement to store air weapons, for instance, in a, a steel box, as there is basically with firearms and shotguns, uh, we've always advised uh, owners of air weapons to ensure that young people cannot um, access the air weapons without supervision. Yeah. Yeah, but were you supportive of, uh, of those regulations? Uh, uh, that was Westminster reports. legislation. Which I tend to deal with Scottish legislation but I do not remember us opposing something and we wouldn't oppose anything as simply I'm sure um, David will be able to confirm that. Mr Penn? Uh, I can confirm that the measures recommended were discussed at length with the Home Office and agreed by the shooting organisations. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anne McTaggart, please. Thanks, convener. Um, could I ask Mr Bately had mentioned earlier about um, the impacts on transporting or, or the sale of air weapons to perhaps people that come in from abroad that maybe will want to purchase them here. Have you done any scope on what the financial impact that maybe will have to the gun traders? Mr Batley. Yes, it's a difficult thing to calculate, but we do believe that there will be an effect but this effect will only be able to be determined when we know how many licenses or certificates have been issued and how many people have handed in weapons. And then we'll be able to recalculate what trade there is left. At the moment, it would be pure guesswork for us to say there will be these, this number of people with air, guns, air weapons certificates and how, how it will affect the trade. There are going to be complications because of the fact there is no border. There are going to be complications with visitors' permits, which we've which we'd like to address. There is a particular complication where one deals in Scotland with what we call remote sales. In other words, a dealer, in, a registered firearms dealer in Scotland sells an air weapon to somebody who is a visitor to Scotland who neither has a certificate or a visitor's permit. The, legis the bill, as it is drafted, says that the dealer in Scotland may send this air weapon out with Great Britain. That means, the way it's written, that the dealer will not be able to send it to somebody in England. They will have to send it elsewhere. The wording is actually out with Great Britain. In England is most certainly in Great Britain. And that's an anomaly we, we have picked up in the, in the bill. In terms of what you said earlier about mm -hmm. the possibility of an increase in, uh, in clubs if the legislation does pass, um, does that mean, uh, to, to, to use a, a well-known phrase, that the market may go up as well as down in terms of your trade? I wish I knew the answer. Yeah. I'm afraid I uh, don't. Mr. Penn, you wanted to come in. Uh, no, uh, John Batley covered the point okay. I was going to raise. And do you want to come back? Yeah, just my last question. It's really about um, does the panel see any positive outcomes from the bill? Uh, Dr. Shedden? Um, one of the unintended consequences, which could affect an organisation like BASC is the fact that people who have had air weapons in the past because they were unlicensed 
and now would be exposed to a licensing regime may well think to themselves, well, I have a low powered air weapon just now, but if I need to get a license, I might as well get a license for either a more powerful rifle or for a shotgun. So we may actually see a number of people moving from unlicensed air weapon shooting into licensed firearm and shotgun shooting, which from my perspective would be quite rewarding because uh, I do monitor um, how influential we are by the number of people who have firearm or shotgun certificates in Scotland. Um, so we may see an increase in, um, inverted commas, serious shooting in Scotland because of the consequences of this legislation. Mr Penn. I would concur with Colin Shedden and I'm afraid I cannot see any other benefits arising. Okay, Mr Ellis. Certainly the feedback from our membership is that should a, a heavy licensing system come in, they will migrate on to, as Colin called it, proper shooting away from uh, low-powered air weapons. Mr Batley? Yes, I think one of the important things here is going to be the cost of the certificate. We have to take into account that a considerable proportion of the air weapons that are held in Scotland are worth probably less than £100. If the certificate is enormously expensive, and the security requirements are more than they are described in the bill, there is a temptation for some people perhaps not to register voluntarily at the start. So I think that is going to have an influence on how many people actually register. Anne? Convener, I'm not really sure if that was a positive or not. <laughs> <laughs> or, not or it's just raised even greater concerns. Um, okay. No, that's me. Um, John Wilson, please. Thank you, convener, and good morning, gentlemen. I, I, the sense of disclosure, I should say, that I uh, used to plink as a child uh, and received a visit from the police when I was plinking out in my back garden. Uh, while the police were satisfied uh, what I was doing was safe <coughs> uh, and within the limits, it was because of the alarm and distress that could be potentially caused to the neighbours that they suggested that I uh, cease uh, carrying out that activity. And that, I think, is part of the problem in relation to the issue, is about the alarm and distress that is perceived to have been caused, and the legislation that's proposed is for public safety. Do you think that it's sufficient to bring in the issue about public safety, because the, the, particularly in terms of plinking, uh, because many, as you said, young adults, children, get into the sport through that activity uh, and may be subjected to, a, as I was 40 years ago, a visit by the police uh, to, uh, because neighbours were concerned and the fact that they weren't causing any harm or any uh, serious danger to anyone else uh, in their activities. I never heard the police visit. Uh, Mr Batley. Public safety forms the background of all firearms legislation and public safety is paramount for anything to do with firearms legislation. Uh, I, th I think that's the succinct answer to the question. Public safety has to be maintained and all the shooting organisations that I'm aware of and part, and part of are very, very keen on, um, on, on, the, on public safety. Mr Ellis. Just picking up on, on your comments there, I think it highlights that licensing probably wouldn't have done anything to resolve that situation. Um, if you're licensed to shoot in your backyard, that concern with your neighbour would probably still have arisen. The uh, police would probably still have turned up. I think what it highlights is there's a, there's a lack of public education. They don't really understand what air gun shooting is, what the obligations and responsibilities of air gun shooting is. And I think it also highlights the, the lack of communication that probably goes on between the shooting community and the general public. Um, so, yeah. You mentioned there that folk don't know their obligations. Do you think if they were licensed, uh, they would have uh, more idea of what their obligations actually were? I think it depends very much on the shooting organisations, and Dr Shedden would be able to answer this, but shooting organisations are very keen on codes of practice and explaining and training and education. Mr. Penn. Uh, I can only go back to the large numbers of air weapons that are out there in the hands of private individuals in Great Britain. 
and the very small number, relatively speaking, of incidents that occur and the low levels of complaint so far as we're aware. So there's an awful lot of shooting going on which isn't causing very much of a problem. And I very much agree with Graham Ellis that it is a question of better education of the public at large. Uh, Dr Shedden. Yes, public safety is obviously very important and um, education is uh, something we spend a considerable amount of time on, whether it's uh, with young people and adults. And uh, we've also on occasion been able to um, get along to schools to give information and practical advice on the use of air guns. And it just points out to me the fact that there probably are people out there that could if they took their air gun into their garden, caused some public concern. And it'd be wonderful if um, publicly funded facilities could be made available in certain situations that could um, help to both educate and uh, facilitate safe air rifle shooting in urban areas, for instance. Mr Ellis talked about the obligations, though, and said that you were maybe better placed to answer it. Would a licensing regime maybe actually ensure that folks knew what their obligations were? Uh, I think those that come forward voluntarily to submit themselves for a licence probably do understand what their obligations are and what the law actually states. Um, but what we've found certainly over the past 10 or 20 years um, has been that uh, the law is complex. There are about 30 pieces of legislation covering air weapons in Scotland just now. And to put that into simple codes of practice so that parents in particular can understand it has been a challenge, but we've achieved that. Um, so I, th I think it is very important that we get a simple message across. And the message has been from Scottish Government and from ourselves that air weapons are not toys and they're not to be treated as toys, but they can be used safely and responsibly in many situations. John? Having said that, Dr Shedden, some of the evidence that we've been provided with in terms of the the power of the weapons, and it's the, to do with the power of the weapon. Uh, we've been provided with evidence, uh, particularly an ACPO report from south of the border, that says that airsoft weapons now have a capacity greater than that of some of the air weapons that will be licensed in Scotland. Do you think that these weapons, the paintball weapons and other airsoft weapons, should be looked at in relation to the legislation uh, because they may have an if we are following guidance and research from elsewhere and we are putting in limits in terms of their weapons that, can, that have to be licensed then does that could that potentially mean that we then go for a wider licensing regime which may include airsoft weapons and paintballing weapons Dr. Shedden. Uh, can I defer that question to John Bartley? He's Mr. got much Bartley more knowledge. Then, please. <laughs> I think what you've done by introducing a lower limit of one joule covers that quite adequately. There is a lot of conflicting me medical, uh, medical reports talking about the level of lethality. By utilising the term air weapon, you have very, very neatly given it a band. You've got between one joule and six and 12 foot pounds. Six and 12 foot pounds, over that, we know they're licensable. Below that, one dual level, which you've introduced, the medical evidence that we've seen, which we've looked at at considerable depth, confirms that items like the airsoft that you're talking about are not lethal, providing they're properly used. Right. You could say that about air weapons, if they're properly used, are not lethal. Sorry? If, the, if air weapons, if they are properly used, are not lethal. Sorry. No, an air weapon, by the definition in 13B, is always lethal. There is no question about that. It's a lethal barrel firearm. Below one joule, it should not be lethal. It is not potentially lethal. Therefore, we don't consider it to be a firearm. Right. It's just uh, trying to get around yeah. the technical aspects of what you've just indi in indicated there in terms of the, the lethality of a weapon in terms of air weapons, uh, so it's, it's useful to get that on the record. In relation to the question that was asked earlier about the number of clubs that currently exist, could I ask Mr Ellis, what is the average annual membership fee uh, to members of a air weapons club in Scotland at the present day? It varies marginally from club to club, but on average, an annual membership will cost you £75 for an individual, up to about £115 for a family membership. 
Um, you have range fees above and beyond that for the use of facilities, competitions, etc., etc. So it is an entry-level sport and it is relatively low cost. But it's, potentially the annual membership fee is, can be more than the cost of an air weapon. Yes, but um, you will find that once people enter a club shooting environment that they will rapidly want to upgrade their equipment to take part in whatever event, competition, disciplines that they actually choose to be part of. So while your home plinker, target shooter, domestic shooter may well be sub £100 for an entry-level air gun, you could be talking two, three, four, five, up to £7,000 for a competition air rifle. Could you give an indication of how many clubs exist in Scotland? In Scotland, under our regime, there are 13 uh, clubs. The average membership of those clubs varies from about 40 through to about 120, so that they're on about 80 to 90 members each. We are struggling to set up additional clubs because securing facilities and getting planning approval is exceedingly time-consuming and complex. You said 13 clubs under your regime. Under our regime. Obviously, okay. there's the NSRA clubs who also support um, air, right, air weapon shooting, which I believe you said this morning was about 100 and... Someone did mention this morning, about 150 NSRA clubs. In Scotland? In Scotland. But those are predominantly full bore and rimfire rather than air rifle, and the air rifle representation within those clubs would be very small. Right, thank you very much indeed. OK. Alec Rowley, please. Um, could I pick up on the, the question of plinking again? And for what I can see for the policy memorandum, um, really what the Scottish Government seem to be saying is that you know, if an individual applies to have a licence for a, an air weapon um, and the police judge that where they want to use that air weapon, i.e. in a built up area, uh, an urban garden, running onto gardens, children running about, whatever. If the police judge that that could cause a difficulty, a hazard for, for others, then, then they would, would refuse that. Does that not seem reasonable enough that, I know somebody mentioned earlier that this could come down to whether you have a big garden or a small garden, but is it not about the police judging whether it's safe um, to be able to, to use that in, in a built-up area that could be a threat to others? Who wants to go first there? Dr Shea. Yes, I can answer that one. Um, yes, it is reasonable um, that the good reason is investigated. The unfortunate thing is that the, um, the paperwork indicates that the average amount of time spent in each application, 98% of applications, would be 1.2 hours, which doesn't give enough time for consideration or even a site visit. Um, so I don't think based on the um, notification from Police Scotland, I don't think that they will have the ability to take each case on a case-by-case -case merit, and basically they would look at someone in a suburban or urban area and pre decide that no, it wouldn't be suitable. Um, if each case was to be looked at in the same way as firearm shotgun certificate applications are, that usually requires five hours of licensing officer time, which would significantly increase the cost. And I think that's what Callum Steele was trying to indicate. Some of the figures in there seem to have been plucked out of the air without real consideration as to what happens in the ground. Um, and what concerns us is that there would be a blanket presumption against informal shooting in a garden. Anyone else want to come in on that? Mr Ellis. So just to, to highlight where the complexity comes in, we have competition shooters who shoot pistol at the six foot pound, a uh, 10 metre rifle at the six foot pound level, within their own house. They don't need to go outside to the garden. So that, that is within the safe bounds of their home, within concrete walls. But how would you differentiate that between a built up area and a controlled environment. So there's, there's the complexity of it's not just a zone, a house, a garden, it is the facilities that they've constructed. Alec, do you want to come back? Well, I think it is that, it's that question, just looking at the, the policy memorandum, if we're going to get to the, the crutch of this in the sense of where the Scottish Government seem to be coming from with that, is, it is that question of whether somebody can have an air weapon and use that air weapon in a built-up area that could be perceived to be a threat to others. And what they seem to be saying is the judgment of the police would come down to that. 
And it just seems to me that, and I think you seem to be agreeing, that that's not unreasonable to, to be able to introduce a law that, that would have that. I suppose it comes back to then the question of costs, and that's, that's another matter and one that we were trying to probe earlier as well. But in terms of the cost of the licence itself, do you have any views on that? I mean, should, should the, the, the taxpayer bear any of the cost of this, or should it be the licence? applicant that, that and, and should, should the, the, the licence resemble what the cost is of processing it? Who is going for that one? Dr. I just say very briefly that um, the certificate holder obviously has to pay a proportion of the cost, but we'd also expect the taxpayer to pay a proportion of the cost because the whole process is designed to ensure public safety. It isn't just the certificate holder. So, as has been the case with um, firearm shotgun certificates in the past, a proportion of the cost that the police um, uh, face will be paid for by the applicant, uh, and the rest should be paid for by um, society because society benefits from the benefit. And you all agree with that statement from Dr. Shedd, and I've seen the nods of heads. Do you agree, Do uh, Mr. Penn? <coughs> yes. Mr. Ellis? Mr. Batley, so you believe that the the taxpayer should pick up a proportion of the cost. Mr. Rowley? No, I'm fine. Okay. Any other questions? Committee? No. In which case, can I thank you very much for your evidence this uh, morning, gentlemen? Uh, I suspend and we now move into private session.